You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Most of us are not in that position that we can negotiate the terms. We just have to accept them or not. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. On today's show, Ben has the story of how the FBI gathers mobile device data. I look at a recent case of biometrics being included in a search warrant. And later in the show, Ben's interview with John Von Techner of Vivaldi on his concerns with online surveillance and highly personalized targeting of users on the Internet. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. All right, Ben, before we jump into our stories this week, a couple of uh, little bits of business. First of all, the uh, the big scratchy elephant in the room, which is your voice today. You're a little under the weather. Yes, I am. I apologize for, for really sounding like death. But um, <laughs> hopefully our, our listeners can sympathize and uh, I'll be back in good shape next week. Yeah. Yes, I, I will also <laughs> point out to our listeners that uh, we have, re- because Ben is under the weather, we have reinstituted our COVID protocols and Ben is recording remotely today. We uh, we had we had switched to being back in studio with both of us being fully vaccinated and all that good stuff. But uh, when I heard Ben's voice, I said, you know, Ben, maybe this would be a good week for you to record from home. And yeah, so, I, so think, we're doing I think that. we made the right call. <laughs> I uh, think we did. Losing my voice is one thing, but if you had to listen to two voices like this on our next podcast, that would be a problem. Right, absolutely. I should also point out that uh, a bit of a celebration for us this week, this is our 100th episode. Congratulations to us. (laughs) What what do we get? Uh, we get to do episode 101 next week. That's fantastic. (laughs) That's about it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, quite a milestone. Many podcasts do not make it this far. And, uh, thanks to everybody out there who's listening. And of course the support of our sponsors, we're able to do this every week and, uh, have a good time doing it. So thanks to everybody for helping us get to this point. We do appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks to all our listeners and, uh, good time to, you know, leave us a review, right? There you go, right? <laughs> Leave us Absolutely. those five-star reviews. Yeah, Unless you don't like the us, word. Then, then just go outside. <laughs> right, keep it to yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump in with some stories uh, this week. Ben, why don't you kick things off for us? So it's been a while since we checked in on our friend Joseph Cox over at Motherboard, um, but he has another <laughs> very interesting story today. It's entitled, Here's the FBI's Internal Guide for Getting Data from AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. So somebody with a public policy organization called Property of the People put in a FOIA request and was able to obtain an FBI document training its staff on the cellular analysis survey team 
to collect data from our big telecoms. Mm. Uh, it is a 139-slide deck. I highly recommend you click on it and, and look at the whole thing. It's really fascinating. Uh, but it gives a window into how, how our surveillance state works. Uh, this is something that's available uh, for free to law enforcement agencies across the country. Some of the tools are available for purchase. So uh, what does this tell us? Uh, for one, it's the amount of information that's available to law enforcement and federal law enforcement, the FBI, without a warrant is really significant. One of the slides hmm. describes what you can obtain simply via subpoena, toll records, call to destination search, subscriber information, payment information, electronic serial number, IP addresses, how long the subscriber has had the service, and phone equipment. Uh, and then there is what requires a court order or search warrant, and that's where they get into historical tower information, cell site information, uh, the content of text messages, data connections, pen trap and trace devices, tracking authorization, subscriber information for all of the numbers contacting the target of the search, location-based services, etc. So law enforcement has access to virtually all of the relevant information on our devices, which would allow them to track us, find out where we've been and, and what we've been doing. And the only restriction on them getting this information are constitutional restrictions. We know from the Carpenter case uh, that they have to obtain a warrant to search historical cell site location information. But the law is pretty unclear on a lot of these other, uh, you know, uh, surveillance methods. And I think this is just eye-opening that we have this large slide deck that not only shows what the government can collect, but also how much of our data the phone companies are retaining. And they all have their own different retention uh, policies. Uh, I was sort of surprised to know that AT&T is the company that keeps a law, our call detail records the longest, something like six years, hmm. um, which, I, which I found fascinating. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's all out there. We know that the FBI um, not only collects this information themselves, but they are advising local law enforcement agencies on how to collect this information. Yeah, this is fascinating. And and I guess it's it's not that uh, this information exists. It's just when you have it all collected in one place, it, it kind of, for me, it sort of sets me back on my heels to see it all gathered together in, in one lump uh, as to uh, the the range, the scope of, of what they're able to do here and, and the real specifics on how they're able to do it. Right. Uh, and, you know, it, it's sort of uh, a lesson in teamwork here. The reason they're able to collect so much information is telecommunications companies keep so much information. Now, there's a chicken and an egg problem here because the telecommunications only keep the, uh, this amount of information. You know, they'll say this in every quote that they give to journalists because they want to comply with lawful court orders or subpoenas. So it's just sort of when you get ingrained in that practice where all of these companies are storing years worth of location data, of call detail records, and, you know, the government is actively searching out these records, you get this these sort of machinations uh, where this just becomes a matter of course. You can really see that in, in some of these quotes here. When they talk to ACLU lawyers uh, or people who are, you know, public policy advocates, they'll say, there's no conceivable business reason they need to obtain this many records. Uh, and then the companies themselves will say, look, this is a tool we use in response to lawful warrants, emergency requests. Uh, you'll appreciate us later because, you know, this is a tool that could be used into a, in response to a case involving armed fugitives with, with missing children. Right. Uh, right. This is a it's common a industry practice. Yeah, uh, but it's like yeah, that I mean, old joke about lawyers that everybody hates lawyers until you need one. Right, everybody hates this until it's your child who's who's held captive, and and I certainly am sympathetic to that. Right, um, you know, I can imagine a situation where if I was desperate in my personal life and somebody was something was happening to to somebody I loved, and I could solve the problem by getting historical cell site location information, you bet I'd be glad these tools existed. Yeah. But I just think we have to recognize how, how overbroad they are. 
and just how granular uh, the detail is on exactly how this is to be collected. I mean, some of these slide decks are, are just things I've never seen, like the exact language that you use in subpoenas uh, to obtain this data. So it was really interesting and eye-opening. Yeah, I was, I was looking at one of the slides here that, that covers all the different retention periods from the different providers. And I can, I can almost imagine someone who's concerned about this, taking this into consideration when they choose their provider. Like, you know, how long are they going to keep my information around? If, if you're someone who's concerned about privacy, uh, there is a difference between the major providers here. There sure is. Our provider retention policies, I, I said six years for AT&T, it's actually seven years, uh, but they do not hold a candle to Sprint, who uh, holds subscriber information for 10 years. Now, uh, the timelines are, are different for different types of collection. So for call detail records, AT&T is seven years, T-Mobile, uh, Metro PCS, Sprint, 18 months to two years, Verizon one year, U.S. Cellular one year. Now, yeah. this is as of March 2019. It's very possible that these numbers have changed. Uh, it's been over two years. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if if I was a potential consumer and I had access to a chart like this, I think it would inform the decisions I made about which uh, device to purchase. Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating aspect as well, that I, I think it's fair to say that we are um, in a zone where privacy is a consideration of consumers. Uh, you look at um, look at a company like Apple who's been leading with uh, you know our devices are privacy uh, friendly, you know that sort right. of thing. We're not going to share your information. So um, it, it, I think that's you know fairly recent that that companies are seeing that leading with uh, privacy can be a competitive advantage. And so it's sort of interesting to see it laid out here in this information as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they'd rather have it not laid out through a FOIA request in a 139-page <laughs> unclassified slide deck. Uh, right. But, you know, if, if you start to see more of this, where you actually have, you know, useful information on the retention policies of these companies, they might use it for a competitive advantage. And there might be an enterprising company that comes in and says, we are now going to be the industry leader, you know, while we will comply with all lawful requests for you know, court warrants or subpoenas, we will delete our subscriber information, you know, in three months, or mm -hmm. we'll delete our call detail records within six months. Um, so I really do think you could see this as, as part of, you know, an expansion of their business practices. And as far as you know, are, 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 there, are there no requirements in terms of retention or are they not obligated to keep things for certain periods of time? There are generally not retention requirements. Uh, there are some statutes like the Stored Communications Act um, that was based on an era before cloud computing existed. So the mm. time limit there was uh, 180 days. and Everything past that 180-day period is fair game for law enforcement because I think when that law was enacted in 1986, they sort of assumed, well, nothing would be available after 180 days. Mm, who has uh, room for that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, that law, you know, for, for better or worse, has, has not been amended. Uh, but there aren't generally requirements for these companies to retain data for a specific amount of time. You know, I think largely they would justify it on, on uh, you know, these are our business records. We like to have information on our own subscribers. Um, you know, this is about, when we're talking about location services, this is about improving customer service grew, you know, uh, finding dead spots in our network, et cetera. So I understand why they would want to keep these for their own business purposes. Uh, but they are generally not compelled to do so uh, by law enforcement. Yeah, fascinating. All right, well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. As Ben said, uh, it's a really interesting slide deck to look through. Uh, if you, I, I'd be, I, I would be willing to guess that if you're a listener to this show, it's the kind of thing that you, you will... Uh, find very interesting to take yeah, a look just at. So embrace nerding out on it. I certainly did. <laughs> I almost yeah. got through all 139 slides. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> well, uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Um, my story this week comes from Forbes, uh, written by Thomas Brewster, and it's titled FBI given power to unlock capital riot suspect phone with his fingerprint. 
So, uh, as we know, we are uh, in the midst of a whole bunch of investigations on the January 6th uh, Capitol Hill riot. Uh, And one of the suspects in that riot, uh, the FBI got a warrant to use his biometric uh, elements, in this case his fingerprints, to unlock his phone. Um, And uh, this is interesting because we've seen different court, uh, different courts have different opinions when it comes to biometrics and whether or not you're violating the Fourth and Fifth Amendment here when uh, requiring someone to use something like their fingerprint or their face or something like that. Um, this article points out that this is actually the second time that Capitol Hill riot investigators have been successful in getting this sort of warrant of using biometrics to unlock a device. Where do you suppose we stand with this, Ben? It's really an unsettled, fascinating legal issue. I know we've talked about it a number of times. It does have Fourth Amendment elements. Um, I think more importantly, it has Fifth Amendment elements. That's the right against self-incrimination. If somebody knows that they have something incriminating on their device and they're forced to unlock it, uh, they would, in essence, be testifying against themselves in a criminal trial. Uh, So we've seen some cases where courts have said this is not testimonial evidence. The right against self-incrimination only applies against so-called testimonial evidence. So, you know, what you'd write, what you'd say, um, even if you're saying it uh, in front of Congress or at a civil hearing, you can invoke your Fifth Amendment right. Uh, But non-testimonial evidence is not covered by the right against self-incrimination. You know, so before we uh, were talking about the digital world, that was something like a police lineup. Uh, You could not invoke your Fifth Amendment right to get out of a police lineup. Hmm. Where it gets confusing here is the use of biometric data. Some courts have said biometric data is non-testimonial evidence, and therefore uh, it would not violate the Fifth Amendment to have law enforcement get access to it. Of course, that is distinct from a passcode, which uh, many courts have determined that that's the content of one's own mind, And therefore, that is testimonial evidence protected by the Fifth Amendment. So the issue is there's not really a practical distinction between typing in your passcode and using biometric information. The same exact thing is going to happen. Your device is going to get unlocked and you're going to be incriminating yourself. Um, So I think this is sort of a false legal distinction. And I think this focus on whether it's testimonial evidence or not is sort of outdated in a world uh, in which we have both biometrics and things like passcodes, it would be better to just have one standard where uh, unlocking a device is unlocking a device, no matter how you do it. And as this article makes clear, courts have come to different conclusions on it. Um, You know, I'm certainly sympathetic to law enforcement here for going out and seeking this warrant. When they unlocked this person's device, this was not an innocent bystander uh, during the January 6th uh, attacks. Um, One of his text messages talked about a souvenir pin from one of those giant mace tanks we used on them, meaning law enforcement. Hmm. Uh, So they must have had some premonition that this person had incriminating evidence on on his device. And certainly you would understand why law enforcement using their proper legal channels would want to force somebody to um, use their, their face or their finger to get into that device. I just think... We do need a unified legal standard where it's the same requirements to unlock a device via uh, biometric data as it is via passcode. And we don't focus so much on this antiquated notion of testimonial evidence. And how do we get there? Is this, is this on a collision course with the uh, Supreme Court? That's always the problem is we really get there by uh, courts in, you know, hundreds of federal districts across the country, state courts coming up with their own justifications and conclusions. Then they argue amongst each other as academics (laughs) in a series of cases. Then uh, the academics themselves write, you know, law review articles on it. And then maybe in 10 10 to 20 years, we'll get a a justiciable standard. So I wish we could just snap a finger and have that standard, but I think it's going to be kind of a long, drawn-out conversation in the legal world. 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine, you know, as you say, a decade from now, where are we going to be with biometrics? So will we have moved on to the next thing by the time we get a ruling on this thing? Yeah, I mean, at that point, they might be able to read the contents of our brains, so. Right, right, exactly. This all might be moved. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, that's an interesting aspect to it as well, that the, I guess the legal system is always a bit of a trailing indicator, right? It always is. It's a huge problem. I mean, I don't know really how to fix it. Courts can only deal with cases and controversies. So first, this is something that actually has to come up in court. Um, And then, you know, generally the Supreme Court will defer to the various judicial circuits across the country to see if there's disagreement among federal appellate courts. And even getting to, you know, to that point can just take a long time. You have a bunch of different cases. Some of them are moot. Um, Some of them haven't ripened. Uh, You know, there's maybe a a reason that a case doesn't make it to the appeals court that's not related to this particular question. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we do have these dueling standards. Uh, and unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wait a while to find, you know, a logical conclusion to this. I will say it. I mean, it does happen. Uh, we all waited in anticipation for the Carpenter decision on cell site location information. We all waited in anticipation on the Van Buren decision for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So, you know, eventually the Supreme Court does decide these questions. I will note that this is the first time in God knows how long that the Supreme Court is not taking up a Fourth Amendment case uh, in the 2021-2022 term. Hmm. I realize this is a Fifth Amendment case, uh, but I was sort of disappointed to see that statistic. They are uh, neglecting our, our area of interest here. (laughs) <laughs> we'll, send, we'll have to send them a strongly worded letter. <laughs> we sure we sure will. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, that is my story this week. Again, that's uh, over uh, on Forbes uh, from Thomas Brewster. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. We would love to hear from you. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or a, a story you want us to address, you can email us. It's caveat at the cyberwire.com. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Ben, a little change of pace this week. Uh, You actually conducted this week's interview with uh, John Von Chechner of Vivaldi, uh, and he was addressing his concerns with online surveillance and the personalized targeting of folks on the Internet. Here's Ben with John Von Chechner. I really think this is something that's doing so much damage in our society. And and I really think, I mean, it should never have been allowed. And I'm not really sure if it was explicitly allowed at any one time. Seemingly just some companies found, hey, we have some data, let's use it. Uh, well, I think most reasonable companies would have thought, hey, there's some data, let's keep it safe. Different approaches. And uh, I think what we are seeing is, is, is what it's doing to our society uh, the divisions that we are seeing as uh, the data is used to decide what kind of information we are being shown and, and dividing us into groups of people based on various levels of data. So I think there's a significant damage coming from this and the sooner we, we kind of fix this, the better. 
So do you think a lot of what we've seen in terms of things like political polarization and social upheaval can partially be attributed to this to this notion of surveillance-based advertising that all of us are only getting access to certain information based on our, our browsing habits. Do you think the problem is is that broad? Yes, I, I do think it's it's that broad. And and I think, I mean, it's it's fairly clear uh, that we are all being fed very different information. And you can look at the the kind of the, the development and the timing and the like. You go 10 years back, the situation wasn't like that. I think uh, we were more on the same planet with regards to the information that we were getting. But gradually during those uh, last years, last 10 years, we've seen a development where it's very clear that people are getting different levels of information, different information. And uh, I mean, part of this is the uh, surveillance-based ads and and part of it is the algorithms that are using the same levels of data to decide what we see uh, at any time. So it's kind of pushing us in the direction of division. And I think it's really unfortunate, and and I think the damage is so big, and we need to to do something about this. I always like to play devil's advocate, Uh, and so thinking of a consumer, if they hear that some entity, some country is doing away with surveillance-based advertising, then they'll think the alternative is increased user fees or subscription fees. And some consumers might say, I'd rather subscribe to the service for free and get fed targeted advertising. What would you say to those consumers? I I, I think they're basically falling for the misinformation. The reality is, I, I mean, I've been on the internet from the very, very, very beginning. And we've always had quite a lot of free stuff. And it was ad based from the very beginning. And it was possible for companies to to uh, be profitable uh, based on the advertisement, the revenues they were getting. So this is not about for or against advertisement. This is for or against a certain kind of advertisement, which is which is actually about collection of data. And and this isn't necessary for these companies to be able to be profitable. I mean, granted, for some of those companies, they've made a bundle from collection, inf- collecting information on their customers. But to me, I mean, there's something significantly wrong with the company that is living off, uh, I mean, basically collecting information on their customers. If you try to think about it, I mean, you wouldn't accept that your mailman would read your mail. You would be horrified. You wouldn't right. accept your telco to be listening to your calls. And uh, I mean, you wouldn't expect, if you, if you have someone coming to your house, maybe a, a painter or a carpenter or the like, that they would collect information about your, what you have of furniture or maybe put up a listening device or anything else like that. So the, the, the fact that these companies uh, have access to our information because of their services, but the point is, instead of keeping our data safe, they're utilizing this data to put us into camps where they can then sell access to us. So basically, they built a programming machine to program us, and, and that's a really bad thing to do. I want to talk a little bit about what happened in Norway. Uh, so the Norwegian Consumer Council published a report calling for a ban on surveillance-based advertising. I want to know exactly what that would look like and if you think that's something that could be replicated, particularly in other Western countries. Um, I'm thinking of, of the United States just because, you know, it, it might be more difficult with our political culture, our First Amendment. Uh, so I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that paper is something that everyone should read, and it's available in English. And they were calling for action, not only in Norway, but in practice in Europe and in the US. Because clearly, for and for this to matter, it needs to be on a broader scale. Now, I think it would be a really nice start for the Norwegian government to take some steps. and But uh, I think the push is towards the EU and the push is towards the US to do something about this. And, and, and I think, I mean, it's, it's just, um, again, they document, they an- actually deal with a lot of the questions uh, with regards to uh, kind of, does this need to be this way? And all the argumentation that uh, the big tech companies are coming with. And I, I think they, they deal with them in a really good way. And, and now that document and the signatures were sent to the EU and to the US, uh, we joined this effort as well, with a number of other companies that are privacy-focused. 
And I, I think we're, we're basically pushing for this to go through. And I think, I mean, t- technically speaking, yes, it's a big change. But on the other hand, it's a big change that happened 10 years ago that we are reversing. And I think in the report, they're comparing uh, the, what they've been doing to asbestos. And I actually think that's a really mm. good comparison except asbestos actually had some positive use to begin with. Well, I actually think this never had. But the reality, I think gradually we are understanding how much damage this is having. Right. I mean, it's, it, and, and it's not really about so much about privacy of the individual. I think the focus on the privacy of the individual has been part of the problem because the, 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 the problem is much bigger than that because it's a society problem and you basically put a programming machine that can be used to influence groups in smaller groups to have opinions that they otherwise wouldn't have. And I think that's just really damaging. And so the question is, do we want that? I mean, and, and we've dealt with things like this before. Interstitial ads in movies, right? Mm-hmm. That got banned. Uh, and I think this is a lot worse. I mean, a million times worse. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically, a, again, it's a programming machine to program us. And it's dividing us. And uh, I mean, so we are having discussions. How are we going to deal with Thanksgiving? How are we going to deal with Christmas? Mm-hmm. When the, even the families are divided. And why are we so divided? And what happened? And I think there needs to be a realization that a big part of that is the surveillance-based advertisement and and the algorithms that are used to divide us. So what do you see as the big political obstacles in both the EU and the US to instituting such a ban? And how do we get beyond those political obstacles? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of money involved and a lot of lobbying involved. Absolutely. So there's big tech and they have deep pockets and they do not want to lose this ability to collect our data. And they have good friends in uh, both the United States Congress and in the European Parliament, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and, and that's basically what's in their way. I mean, it's, it's, it's really simple. So what we need to do is we need to help our politicians do the right thing because I, I think in general they want to do the right thing. But obviously they will be told various arguments that if... If this were to change, then a lot of companies would cease to exist, right? They would struggle with not having this way of advertisement. But the reality, the biggest winner from this change is is, uh, fake news. I mean, it's it's a brilliant business model for fake news. So can you expand on that a little bit? How does the advertising-based or the surveillance-based advertising model contribute to the outbreak of fake news specifically? Well, I mean, the business model for, for fake news, if you look at it, I mean, typically larger, uh, if, if you're doing um, uh, larger newspapers or, or the like, you, you'll do your news and then people will come to it and the like. With, with uh, the fake news, I mean, you basically take whatever you have from someone and you, you, you make it more interesting, you use bigger words and the like, so people will click it. And then you'll pay Facebook, uh, for example, to, to make sure that it gets shown uh, or you just kind of play with the algorithms, uh, and, and suddenly you're reaching uh, an audience that is uh, ready for it, right? right. So, so the business model is spend very little on content, very much on marketing, and then make more from the ads. So it's, 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 it's optimized for that kind of content, sadly. It is, yeah, and obviously that has terrible effects on society writ large because fake news we've seen during the pandemic uh, has led to our, uh, you know, poorer conditions in public health. It's corrupted our political system. So so that definitely makes sense. I guess proposing a couple of alternatives to an approach of doing away with surveillance-based advertising uh, in a policy sense, and just to get your reaction to these, what about requiring consumers to opt in to surveillance-based advertising as an alternative in order to, you know, for Google to uh, track your purchases across different websites, there would have to be a meaningful opt-in beyond just the EULA. You know, you'd have to uh, have something that would be readily understandable for the consumer. Would that be a reasonable alternative or does that fall short in your view? I mean, for me, I'll tell you one thing, GDPR and, 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 and cookie dialogues. Right. Has it worked? 
No is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. It ha- I mean, basically, you have all these dialogues showing up everywhere, and pe- people to just click them. And reality. I mean, when it comes to kind of signing up for your computer or your phone or the like, where you basically just have to accept. It's similar to going to the bank and wanting to negotiate the deal with the bank, right? Right. M- most of us are not in that position that we can negotiate the terms. We just have to accept them or not. So it, 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 it just doesn't work. But I think it's also, it's an unreasonable thing to ask for, right? I think there's certain things it's unreasonable to ask for. And part of that is, can I collect all your information and utilize it to create profiles on you so we can influence you better? I mean, come on. And, 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 and the reality is, the figures we are talking about are not that huge, by the way. Right. So we are selling ourselves and access to ourselves for fairly small amounts of money uh, on a yearly basis. And that's giving, yes, it's giving those companies a, a significant revenue. But the reality is, I mean, the damage to society is much, much, much bigger than that. So if, if you wanted to invest in society, you could just pay these guys off, although I don't think they deserve it. Uh, but that could be an alternative from a public policy perspective. What what do you see as the role of the private sector here? So if you were to take a cynic's view and say, I don't expect the European Union uh, or the United States to actually take meaningful action on this, how can the private sector step in to help address this problem? Well, I mean, we're trying to do what we can, right? As, as a company, for example, we'll, we'll put in uh, ways for users to stop tracking and, 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 and kind of stop ads and, and the various other things. But the problem that I see is as long as the majority of the users are using uh, services and using browsers that collect your information, uh, you have a problem. And, and, and I, even though I'm, I have big hopes like for our company to grow and, and, the, and for the others that are following in the same footsteps and doing the same things as we are, I really think that the only viable way of dealing with this is through regulation. And I just think, as a society, we need to say what is okay to do and what isn't okay to do, and we need to regulate it. Again, I mean, people can help put pressure on this. Uh, I mean, they can obviously select and go with players that are doing the right thing. And I think I would urge everyone to do that. But but in reality, to, to fix this as a society problem, it doesn't help that you and me and, and uh, some millions or tens of millions or even 100 million are kind of choosing products that are not tracking them. There's still most of the other people on the planet are using those products from big tech. There's a reason why they're called big tech. Right. They have the market share. Yeah. They have the market share. And, and uh, as long as they get away with it, we have a problem, Right. And in reality, they even have a benefit compared to others because of, uh, of, of what they're doing. I mean, obviously, they can make more money from selling our data than uh, all the companies that are doing the right thing in some ways. But again, so I think regulation is, is, is the right thing to do. Uh, and, and we as consumers, we can make choices by selecting companies that we uh, believe are doing the right thing. But I also think we need to help our politicians to do the right thing because a lot of them want to do the right thing. And, and, and so if we, we tell them we have their back, that's, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Do you have recommendations just for listeners um, in the United States or abroad of, of what are some action steps you could take to uh, encourage le- legislators to, to try to adopt these regulations? I mean, are there uh, active uh, you know, issue campaigns uh, in this realm? Uh, that you're aware of or, or other ways that consumers themselves can have a voice? I think, I mean, the, the, you can always send a, a message to your congressman or, sure. or, or, or to anyone that is in power that might have your ear. Uh, I also think basically just uh, sharing uh, those opinions out there and, and getting it spread. I think it's really important that you're seeing that this needs to change and and voicing that you want to see this change. And I think that's what I'm trying to do and that we're all trying to do is to get the word out so people understand really what's happening because it's it's a learning thing. I mean, and, and clearly we are, we're fighting a big machine that is, is, is going around telling people, oh, if we can't do this, you have to pay huge amounts for your kind of these services that used to be free, by the way. Right. Uh, without this side effect. 
because yeah, and it ultimately wasn't. it's 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 a false choice. Yeah. Yes. And and I, and I also think if they're not able to kind of run their businesses without spying on their customers, they should do something else. All right, interesting uh, topic, Ben. Uh, really a fascinating conversation there. Yeah, it was nice to, see, <clears throat> to hear my good voice back in the day because <laughs> that was recorded <laughs> right. uh, before I sounded like this. So, yeah, that <laughs> might be, be the only part of the podcast that uh, our listeners can tolerate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think as we address here so often, you know, John's points are excellent that um, – it's hard to when, – when these things head in one direction when it comes to surveillance and, and the targeted advertising, I mean, as we're recording this, we're seeing all sorts of revelations about uh, things going on with Google and Facebook and, and how they've been uh, sort of stacking the deck in their own favor when it comes to targeting users and uh, to their own advantage for advertising technology and so on and so forth. So you know, it's good to know that we've got folks like John out there who are uh, – Sort of keeping an eye on this and trying to to counter that push back in the other direction. Yeah, and he's been an industry leader on this for a very long time, and I I really enjoyed speaking with him and, and hearing his insights. Yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to uh, John von Chechner from Vivaldi for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening.